Hi, and welcome to ElmsLN.org. I'm your voiceover artist, Brian Olendike from Penn State University. And today we're going to be talking about dreaming the NGDLE into reality. So what is an NGDLE? And how do I get one? Uh, isn't this just a fancy word for an LMS? You know, this thing, right? That all of our institutions have, where we have consistency, uh, everything is centralized to our institution. We have a uniform user experience and those are great, right? So aren't we just talking about that? No, NGDLE is about the thing after that and it does involve that as well. So really what I like to do is use this phrase for NGDLE is next generation distributed learning ecosystem. We're talking a lot more about the interconnections between uh, systems so that we can better meet the needs of learners uh, through better experiences, newer experiences. Uh, so I would visualize it more like this, right? Instead of a single silo, you know, maybe we have other functionality that takes place outside of that silo. Maybe we're passing things back into silo. We get much more of a networked approach to the way in which we deploy uh, educational experiences. Uh, as a very brief review of the state of NGDLE. There's a few entries into this space. Uh, so Dr. Chuck is working on something pretty neat called SUGI, which is this idea that you kind of take the LMS and learning systems in general, break them down into lots of little teeny tiny systems that then can be repurposed and deployed in against multiple LMSs, against MOOCs, uh, all over the place. Uh, so worth checking out, it's not entry into this idea, right? He's using it a lot as far as the way at which you extend Sakai into other spaces and, you know, reuse your own efforts. Paul Hibbets and has this idea of a flipped LMS. And as he envisions a flipped LMS, we have a system called Grav or it's, it's a Grav CMS. It's a standalone, uh, kind of like a WordPress, if you will, or a Drupal, a, a static site generating system uh, that manages things in Markdown. So he actually routes students, if you will, to all the different places that they're going to go through this course hub site. Uh, so using a little bit of glue to stitch the experience together, he expands the worldview beyond just the old LMSs of yesterday. And of course, the reason why you're hopefully here watching this video today. So what the heck is ElmsLN? We envision ElmsLN something like this. We're not talking about a single system. We're not talking about one type of experience. We're talking about organic experiences and a way of capturing those organic things, those messy things that happen in classrooms. I think, oh, oh, what's the word? Innovations. Capturing innovations and doing so in a sustainable way. So we view innovations as this fractal pattern, and that's a lot of where our iconography comes from because education is an ecosystem of its own. So let's use an ecosystem to power it. What is Elms LN? All right, so fundamentally we kind of have an idea. We get a big idea. Whoever gets a big idea, it doesn't matter, but we have a big idea. And then whenever we get a big idea, we're gonna throw that at a new domain. This may seem like it's not really a big deal, but this is fundamentally different from an LMS type of an approach and a deployment architecture approach in which you have everything in one location. So we're talking about a distributed learning network. Elms is actually lots and lots of systems working together, acting as one. But doesn't that create a distributed user experience? Because we're sending people all over the place, and that's probably not a great thing for UX patterns, right? Well, we'd argue you use a distributed user experience pretty much all the time. Uh, Google pi really pioneered distributed user experiences and they pass you to different domains, they have different applications with different names, different branding, and they've been working really hard to unify their branding. Uh, they have a, a specification called Material, and now Material is gonna make all the things in the Google App Suite feel exactly the same. Microsoft has actually kind of beat Google to the punch at this a few years ago uh, with the relaunch of Outlook.com and all of their uh, Office 365 products that were online. 
that you have consistent user experience across applications, but that doesn't mean they're all the same application. So let's see what we mean in Elm's context. So when someone experiences a course, they're actually at a domain that's courses dot wherever it lives slash the name of the course. It's a different URL from other parts of the ecosystem that are going to be stood up. So if we were to build a discussion forum system, that discussion forum system would live at discuss dot whatever the institution is slash course name. This allows for innovations to be built out in kind of that fractal imagery that I showcased, but they can be done so sustainably. We can have discussion forum 2.0 or discussion 3.0 types of versions. We can play with different types of ways of having conversations across different courses and then allow those courses to influence and improve our overall, overall portfolio. So how do we get there visually, right? Is if you notice between the two, if I go back to the content one, that I've got that highlighted, right? So I can see my ecosystem on a single bar. I know where I can go, what applications I can use, and those applications get integrated into the system itself. So my content outline might have all of this other stuff like discussions going on right inside of it. But if I really wanna dig in deep to a discussion or maybe I don't wanna use a content thing, that's a separate application. And so we can kinda of keep following this pattern over and over and over again for other things. Well, how is this possible? It's because what we've actually created is known as a self-federated system. And so any place that you go in Elms, you could technically pop open the hood and see the data driving it. And because we follow a pattern and it's a consistent pattern across the way we build all of these things, it's very easy for us as developers to get data from point A to point B. So when we stand up a studio, maybe it's actually running some other framework inside of it, right? Right now, most of what we do is, is Drupal and increasingly something called web components, but that all can live in this consistent user experience, right? So now I know that I'm at the studio application because I have that. We have some consistent colors to indicate the difference between a studio tool and a discussion tool or a course tool. You see the slight color changes as we go through there, but I can keep unlocking newer uh, potential, newer ideas, and just keep driving innovation forward in this sustainable way. So the thing powering that, again, because we have this self-federated system, is also just data. So this also allows us kind of infinite flexibility even beyond you know, Drupal, which is the platform we use for a lot of the system. So then something like a logistics arm of the institution is not in the exact same system as the content. Uh, so, you know, when you have a learning management system, a lot of times those are built logistics first. They need to be managed by administration officials. That is going to have implications for your design downstream. So let's put all that data in the place that we can consistently tap it with our other systems so that we can make better decisions and still keep things organized, but not force that type of uh, design pattern upon students. Uh, similarly, if we want to build a media system. Now we can build a media solution. We want to build a next gen video solution. We can do that at a consistent pattern of name and course uh, spacing. Something else that fits well with this in this distributed ecosystem of NGDLE approach is uh, learning record stores or LRSs. So this would be maybe you slap LRS dot whatever your setup is, right? In this case, we have um, a learning locker instance that all of our other parts of our ecosystem are feeding data back to so that we can normalize and relate it. Well, again, because we're hitting a consistent pattern and we have other things submitting XAPI statements from all over the place, we can start to visualize this data in context no matter where you are, whether you're viewing a media asset because you're in charge of uploading the video or you're a, a faculty member saying, gee, are people watching these videos? We can answer these kinds of questions. And we use tools like H5P, like Learning Locker, and lots of awesome standards as far as charting and visualization to do so. So who's involved as of the time of this recording? Uh, you've got three colleges at Penn State that have deployments of this architecture and are working with it. Uh, WVU online division is also exploring implementation 
And Buttercup's training has uh, an active deploy with thousands and thousands of users to uh, do uh, medical training. Let's look at a few examples quickly. So this is a, a music course about the Beatles that, that we do in arts and architecture. This is a, um, a digital multimedia design fundamentals course. This is a studio for a different DMD course in this case, right? So we have some, you know, creative, creative flair that we allow via, you know, iconography, banners, things like that. You can see uh, in business context, we can see it in a math context. We can see, you know, this is the platform with some customizations by, by uh, that third party vendor. Uh, we can also then take this and make it completely open. So this is actually a, a slightly modified Elms deployment uh, that's powering OER courses uh, about research ethics. So I hope this has been helpful in understanding the larger context of NGDLE and how we view the world. If you have any questions, feel free to jump in on our support forums. Uh, we're very active on Twitter and, and Slack channels and GitHub. Uh, so... Hope to see you soon.